Well, good morning. How are you today? Good. Well, welcome. If you're joining us online, we're glad to have you back. We took the month of uh, October off because we did an At The Movie series, and there's uh, legal issues with uh, putting uh, uh, movie clips like that. So, But anyway, so you're joining us, hopefully, and we're glad to be uh, starting this new series on Advent. Now, Advent, if you have come from a more traditional background, you're, you, you're probably familiar with Advent. That is the first four Sundays before Christmas, kind of leading into Advent. Advent is looking to the coming of the King. The, the people in the uh, before Jesus came, they were they had been longing for, looking for this long-awaited promise of the Messiah, and so Advent is 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 that for us as well. But Jesus has already come, but now we're longing for Him to be in our heart, and also He promises He will come again. So that is Advent for us is looking towards Christmas and the promises that God has for us. Well, as we look at the Christmas story over these next four, four weekends, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, key characters that, uh, that play an important role. In fact, they have to answer some important questions that determine their destiny. So we are going to look at those questions. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, today we'll look at Mary. She had, obviously, she had some important questions that she had to answer. Will she do what God has for her and what God's destined for her? And then Joseph, it affected him. This whole, this whole Messiah coming. He was engaged to Mary, and he has to kind of process that and answer questions. You have the same thing with the shepherds and then with the, uh, with the, uh, the kings, the magi. And then we're going to end uh, the, with the innkeeper and the questions he had to answer on Christmas Eve, our Christmas Eve service. We have two services, 4.30 uh, and 6 p.m. candlelight service. We'll do the candle, candle lighting of the candles and then also singing uh, a lot of Christmas songs and kind of telling the Christmas story through songs and some readings. So I hope you'll be able to be part of that as well. Well, today we are talking about Mary. Now, whenever you bring up Mary, you know, people, uh, they have different views that they've picked up about Mary. Not all of it's found in the Bible, and it's not all accurate. For example, some people say, well, Mary is like perfect. Well, the Bible does not say that. Some people say, well, Mary's sinless. Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. In fact, we'll see this in a verse uh, today where she says that she needs a Savior. Why? Because she herself has sin in her life. But, but what makes Mary unique is not that, nowhere, nowhere does the Bible say that we pray to our worshiper. What makes her unique is that she trusted God. She, she was willing to just obey God and trust Him. And we see that in this story in Luke 1. You can pull out your Bible if you'd like and read along in the, in the uh, NIV. And here's what it says. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So there's the story. She's a virgin. She's young. She's, in those days, there were prearranged marriages, usually very young. Like they would get engaged at 13 and then married at 14. Why so young? Because they didn't live as long. I mean, they had disease. They had war. They had all kinds of things. Uh, they didn't live to the, the average age. was not like it is today where it's in the 70s and 80s and 90s. It was often in the 40s or even the 30s. So they started much younger. And so Mary was probably, probably about 13 or 14. And so the angel said to Mary, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, here's Mary's response. Mary was greatly troubled. I mean, here, I mean, obviously an angel comes. He's got a word for her. She's greatly troubled. But what I've discovered in my life, and certainly I think you'll identify this in your own life, if God comes and has a message for you, our response generally is not like, well, yippee. It's, it's like, that's troubling. You know, I, I mean, we're creatures of habit. We like things in control. We like things, uh, status quo, just keep things going. I mean, just anything that's going to turn over our apple cart and make us uh, unnerved or uncomfortable, it, it, what happens? We get troubled. And when we read God's Word, when we read the Bible, there's a lot of troubling stuff in there. It's good news, but you got to have the right mind frame, the right, the right uh, state of mind for it and the, and the right heart. Otherwise, this is like, why would I do that? Why would I do that with my finances? Why would I do that with my time? 
Why would I do that with my relationships? I'm, I mean, I'm, why, why should I go first in, in offering forgiveness? Or on and on. I mean, just, there's just so many things that they're troubling. And so this is true for Mary. She's greatly troubled at his words and wondering what kind of greeting this might be. Then the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus. So here's some things already coming out. Hey, here's, we got a name for him, <laughs> or everything. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, <clears throat> and he will reign in the house of Jacob forever. So these are all code words that she understood. Code meaning this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. This is the long-awaited one all the way back in the, in, with Abraham. And when Abraham was told he was going to have the descendants of, and, and the Messiah would come through his, his lineage. And, and he, she understands that. And, and, and it would happen through Jacob, who, who is part of the lineage, and, and David. And so this all code language saying, this is, this is, this is that person who, who the prophets had talked about. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. In other words, it's going to be something God does, not something that humans do. So the Holy One will be born and that will be born will be called the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph. Joseph's not going to be part of this. This is something God is going to do. This is a virgin birth. So very miraculous, obviously. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. So what makes Mary special is not that she's, because she's highly educated, no, because she wasn't. Not that she had a lot of power or prestige, no, she was just a peasant girl. Not that she was super mature, no, she's a teenager. No, what made Mary special was that she was willing to do what God asked her to do. And it's just like God to give a relative, somebody to kind of bring support, Elizabeth, because you see with that kind of news that she's a virgin, she's going to have a baby, that baby's going to be the son of God, that's, that's not going to go down too good. Her mom's going to reject her. Her, her, her. her girlfriends, if she tells her girlfriends. If, you, if, girls, if, a, if your girlfriend told you, hey, I'm pregnant and, you know, I'm still a virgin. I mean, is, are you going to believe that? No, right? And so she knows that her friends aren't going to believe her. And her, her, uh, her community won't believe her. She's going to be ostracized and demeaned and, and all those kinds of things. And so she's feeling pretty isolated at this point. But... The, and they don't have telephones and internet and stuff like this. So, so God tells her. He says, no, there's Elizabeth, who's, that's Mary's aunt, says your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And certainly she knew she was past childbearing years. You see, Elizabeth and Zachariah had tried to have kids for years. They had no children. They couldn't. They had infertility issues. And so finally their childbearing years were way past. And yet God gives Elizabeth a son, it's going to be John the Baptist. That would be Jesus' cousin, quasi-cousin. And so it's miraculous. In fact, it shocks Elizabeth so much, she doesn't even talk about it. She doesn't tell anybody for five months. And, uh, and so, you know, but she knows it's a, a miracle. So Mary hears about that. And so she decides to hightail it down and see her aunt, who's also going through a miraculous birth, that she would believe her. And so she goes down there to see her, and, and, uh, and, in this, and, it, and she's in her sixth month. And for nothing is impossible for God. Mary responded. Here's her response. This is what makes Mary uh, amazing, right? This is, what, this is what, the, what, what we can learn from it, certainly. I am the Lord's servant, and I am willing to accept whatever he wants. That's a great prayer. Whenever God's calling us to do something and we have doubts and concerns, we're disturbed, greatly disturbed, any of those, our response is, I'm willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said come true. And then the angel left. So this is what, um, this is what, this is our response. This is, and now Mary goes, she leaves Nazareth and she goes down right outside of Jerusalem, where Elizabeth was. It's like if she walked, it would have been about a week. And during that week, she's pondering, and I, she, she probably comes up with this song. Certainly, she has a song when she shows up. And that's her response. Her response is, is 
why, why, did, why did Mary follow God? Why does she, is she willing to accept him? Because of what she knows about God. And it's found in this song called The Magnificent. Okay, and now we're going to look at that. And, we, and in these 11 verses, we find five things that we can do uh, that Mary did when it comes to following God. First is we recognize that God made me for his, for his purpose. God never makes anything in the universe without a purpose. Everything he makes has a purpose. And that includes you. You have a purpose. You are not born by accident. You have an actual purpose. And so part of your job is to figure out what's my purpose. And a lot of people, they never take the time to figure out what their purpose is. They don't know. And it can be real frustrating living in that place. What's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? Uh, Certainly for me, it was hard to find my purpose when I first came to Christ. I came to Christ when I was 18 years old. My brother, my older brother, I have three older brothers. We're all one year apart. My closest brother to me, he he went away for the summer one one, one year and came back and and, uh, somebody told him about Jesus. And so he goes, hey, let me tell you about what I just learned about. And he just shared real briefly. It's about, I don't know, five minutes. Just read this little booklet. Said, you know, tell, told me that God loves me and Jesus died for me and my sins could be forgiven if I just pray this prayer. So I prayed the prayer. And uh, that, was a, that was an important step forward. I mean, that, that was a, a vital step that I step into that. But my life didn't change at all. I still did it. I, I live my life exactly the same, no change at all. It changed later on when I, about a year later, my brother got baptized. I said, you got baptized? He goes, yeah, I got baptized. Well, we got baptized. I said, we were baptized as infants. You know, what's, what's up with that? He goes, well, that's not in the Bible. I thought, whoa, wait a minute. You mean there's things in the Bible that I'm supposed to be learning that are going to direct my life? Oh, Yeah. So then started researching the Bible. All of a sudden I realized, hey, there's a lot in here that has something to do with how I'm supposed to be living my life. And that, that becomes a game changer. And I didn't have any way of like discovering that. It was just kind of like figure it out on my own over the years. And I made a lot of mistakes. That's why when Sharon and I started this church 25 years ago, from day one we thought, hey, we want people to know their purpose. So we came up with this, with this course, Growth Track. Hey, growth track, that will get you firm footing, really help you start to figure out what is my purpose? What is my purpose? That's why if you've not taken growth track, that's, that's your first step. And this weekend starts step one. So it's a great place to step right in. Learn about the church, learn about the vision of the church, and start learning about the God's purpose and how, how you fit into God's greater work. And so that's an important part of, 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 of making this stuff. I didn't know how to do that. And so I was confused. And so figuring out my purpose was not easy. But, but God has a purpose for you. Now, he, she says, uh, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Notice she says she needed a Savior. She goes, I, have a, I need a Savior. But really, I want you to focus in on rejoicing. You see, rejoicing comes from embracing what God has for you embracing it. I told you about a year later, my brother got baptized, but it wasn't really the baptism. That just started it. Then I started thinking about it, thinking, wow, there's, there's a lot going on here. God's con- it's gonna, I can see him really asking a lot. His purpose is like, could be different than mine. And I realized I needed to either, if this thing was real, I needed to either be all in or out. And so that was That was built on certainly the year before saying that prayer got me on the pathway to start asking the bigger question. But I had to ask the the question, am I all in? Because I don't want to be one of those people that it's just like half in and half out. Listen, you're miserable. If, If that's you, where you're a Christian, but you're just half in and half out, you're living your own thing, you're doing your own thing, you're miserable. That's all there is to it. See, you get to choose Will I do God's purpose in my life? Will I decide? Will I do God's purpose? And uh, if, you, if you choose, the only way you're going to find joy in that is to be all in. To say, I'm all in. That's what Mary did. She didn't like walk through life going, well, I'm doing this crappy thing God wants me to do. You know, it's hard. It's difficult. You know, grin and bear it. I'll suck it up. What a bummer. But I'm trying to be faithful. No, no. She rejoiced. This is God. This is what I was made to do. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. 
And when you realize that God has a purpose that he has for you and you embrace it, joy follows that. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. He made us. You didn't make you. He made us. And we belong to him. We are his people. So that's first of his recognizing God's got a purpose for me. Then no one cares for me more than God. Recognizing that God cares about me. Even the smallest details. You know that Willie Nelson song, You're Always on My Mind? He popularized it, but he didn't write it. Elvis sang it. A whole bunch of people have sung it. It's real popular. It's one of the top country songs ever. And in the song, it you know, talks about how I was never there for you, I know, and never really encouraged you, but you were always on my mind. You know, that's, that's baloney. <laughs> that's not... If, if you, can't, you can't just treat somebody real bad and say, but you're always on my mind, baby. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Now, nobody is always on our mind. We just don't have that capacity. I love my wife to death. She's not always on my mind. I love my kids to death. They're not always on my mind. Nobody's always on my mind. But God says, you are always on his mind. In other words, anything on your mind is on his mind. He's, he, he, he loves you. He can, he's concerned about what you're worried about. The Lord is, and there's just a few, there's many, many verses. The Lord is constantly thinking, constantly thinking about us, and he will surely bless us. Give God all your worries and cares, for he is what? Always thinking about you. Always thinking about you. There's never a time that he's not thinking about you. For he has been, this is what Mary says, for he has been mindful of of the humble state of his servant. He's, he's been thinking about me. He's, th- he's, he's concerned about me. I don't go through this life on my own. God has a purpose for me, but he walks with me. And that's encouraging. That's a big part of how we walk uh, close to God and follow what he has. So he's made us for his purpose. He's, he's always thinking about us. He cares about me more than I care about me. And it's the key to blessing. Following God's purpose is really the key to blessing. See, here's the problem, is that often people will do just what I did when, they, when, I, when I first became a believer, when I, when I was 18. They say yes to God. Oh, yeah, they pray that prayer, and then they live their life like an atheist. You know, I'm going to just do whatever I want. I'm not, I got my plans. Don't mess with my plans now. These are my plans, but I expect you to bless my plans, by the way. You know, I'm not interested in your plans, God. I don't care what you made me for. I don't care about your purpose. I have my goals, my plans, my ambitions, my desires, my dreams. I've been working real hard towards this. This is my thing. Now, Mary certainly had her plans. She was already engaged. She's probably already looking through the catalog and, you know, they didn't have catalogs, but whatever they did back then, you know, she's doing that. She's, got, she's certainly thinking in her mind, dreaming, hey, I'd love this, that. God changes it, and she rejoices, she embraces that. See, because she realized that I have to do what God, if I'm going to follow God, I need to do what he wants me to do. And that's the secret of God's blessing, is doing what God wants you to do. Jesus said, he he goes, I never do anything that that the Father doesn't ask me to do. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. That's true. Why? Because she did what God asked her to do. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. So that's Mary. Good for her, but what about me? Well, you say, well, I don't think God blesses me like that. You're wrong. God will bless you as well. He says, God will show his mercy forever and ever to who? To those who worship and serve him. Not just Mary. For anybody who says, yeah, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to worship. That's, that, I'm, I'm, I'm going all in. He says, forever and ever forever and ever that's a long time no doubt now the the world might not remember you forever and ever but in eternity in eternity forever and ever what you do how you live makes a difference in eternity and let me just say how you view eternity how you view what happens after death radically impacts how you live so if you think you just die and you just you know i know nowadays we just embalm right that's our cremate and then that's it You just, that's it. There's nothing beyond that. You're going to live your life significantly different than if you believe 
that you go and stand before God and you're evaluated on your life. If you've received Christ, there's still an evaluation of how you lived. If you haven't, if you're outside of Christ's grace, that's a big deal. That's a problem. But even if you've put your faith in Christ, how you've lived this one and only life, did you follow God's purpose for your life? That's going to impact how you live. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to reflect back on that. And so Mary understood that. And so she chose yes. So you don't have to choose God's will. He, you see, God loves us and being God is love. And because he's love, he wants us to love him back. But that's by choice. If he just made you love him, you'd just be a puppet, right? That's not real love. You choose to love him. You choose to serve him. You choose to follow God's purpose in your life. Notice it says, today I've set before you, you, you life or death, blessing or curse, oh, that you would what? Choose. You get to choose. I do. And we choose every day. Choose life that you and your children might live. So certainly, our decisions today do impact, they impact our life. Our kids are, are you know, they can impact a lot of people. But it's a choice that we each have to make, okay? Number four, God honors humility. What is humility? Well, humility is, is doing God's plan. That's really what it is. See, pridefulness says, I'm going to do my thing, and I'm going to do it even if God doesn't bless it. Well, that's a bummer. I wanted him to bless it. I guess I'll stop that prayer. But I'm still not doing God's thing. That's pridefulness. And God says, no, if you want to receive God's help, his blessing, his favor, you want, you want, to, you, you want to be in experience God's grace and his fullness. You want to be able to rejoice in your walk. You want power. You want the, the energy, the, the focus, all the things to be able to fulfill what God has for you. It comes with humility. You got to say, I want God's plan over my own. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Before honor is humility. I, would, I want God to honor your life. I want God to honor your business. I want God to honor you. How does that happen? Through humility. I want God's plan for my life. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I want God to lift up your finances. I want God to lift up your health. I want those for you. But there's a choice you have to make, and I want that for me as well. We have to choose. I want to, I'm going to choose what God has for me. And that choice, when you choose what God has over your own, your own plans, that's that's a step of humility. It's saying, I want what God has for me. He is, Mary sings this, he has displayed his power with many mighty deeds, but has scattered the people who are proud and think that they are great ones. She's talking about this irony that the pride, the prideful think they're going to get what they want, but they end up not getting it. He has brought down mighty rulers from their thrones, but has raised up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away with nothing. That doesn't make any sense to us. We think, oh, if I'm rich, I can have everything. But actually, the things that really matter in life, he goes, you end up with nothing if you're prideful, if you're prideful. And so you embrace it with humility. I love this song that Mary sings. It's really rich, really. I mean, she pulls 17 different concepts from the Old Testament. And she, she, didn't even, she was uneducated. She's from a little dinky town. Could you do that? <laughs> Write a song with 17 theological themes and just 11 verses. She's only like 14. You know, this past Sunday, a week ago, was the AMAs, the American Musical Award. And uh, as, as you know, Taylor Swift, she, she won the uh, Musician of the Decade Award. And really, I mean, she's quite, quite a talented young woman. I mean, she, she has more awards than any other musician at 29 awards. And at, at 10, she wrote her first song. At 14, Taylor Swift was picked up by Sony and paid to write songs for them. That's a pretty good resume. But she's still not the best teenage songwriter. It's Mary. Mary's magnificent. And here's deep theological. And over the years, thousands and thousands of plays and songs and oratories, all kinds of things have been built out of this amazing song that Mary, and how did she, she just, she wasn't, she wasn't educated, but she spent time in God's word because she knew that that's where life, where, where she was going to discover what she, God had for her life. And then number five is God keeps his promises. 
Well, this is important. I think it's more important than ever today when so many people don't keep their promises. When a promise doesn't mean anything. And people often have good intentions in relationships to say, hey, you know, make promises. And then it doesn't materialize. Why? Because we, we're, we're fallible. We can't do it. But God is not like that. God keeps his promises. Now, certainly, some promises take a while to be fulfilled. I mean, it's, rarely does God work on our timetable, right? Because our, our timetable is like now. Right, right away. I want it now or, you know, or you're not moving. Well, that's not how God works. Almost always there's a delay from, the when, from when we begin praying and seeking God to when the fulfillment happens. And that happened for Mary. She was willing to wait. And notice this says, He has kept the promise He made to our ancestors. See, they had been waiting for a long time. 2,000 years before Mary was Abraham. God had given him a promise that through his lineage, through his children, that the Messiah would be born. So that's 2,000 years, 4,000 years away from us. And that's the promise he has made to our ancestors and has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. God always fulfills his promise. 700 years before Mary uh, was, was met by that angel and given the Christmas message, a prophet named Isaiah specifically pointed to a, a girl, a young virgin, having uh, the Son of God being born through the Holy Spirit. It says, The Lord himself will choose a sign. This is 700 years before Mary. A child shall be born to a virgin, and she shall call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. All along, God had this plan, not just to bring the Messiah, but to have God come in the flesh, God with us, among us. And he came and was born in a manger, something very humble, unsanitary. And you'd think if God's coming, when a king comes and visits, a, they always stay in palaces and the best hotels. I mean, God comes and, he's, and, he's, and he makes his entrance with, in, the, in, the, in a filthy stable with animals in a feeding trough. See, God comes and he lives among us through Jesus Christ. And then the, that's certainly what we talk about with Christmas. That's the Christmas message. But then Jesus also fulfilled more promises of God when he said he was going to resolve the sin issue, the issue that keeps us far from God, keeps us in a cloud, keeps us from not being able to fulfill what God has for us. And that was by dying on the cross for us. And when we put our faith in what Christ did for us on the cross, that, that, that changes things with our relationship with God. Those things that kept us afar from God, Jesus paid for that so that now we have this, this place where we are like friends with God. The Bible says we can come boldly into God's presence, confidently like a child of God, like a son of God, like a daughter of God. We come because now we're in relationship. We're, we're family. Everybody on the earth is a, cre- is a creature of God, but not everybody is a child of God. You become a child of God by putting your faith in Christ, saying, I want a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the message of Christmas. And certainly Mary figured that out. She said, I'm, uh, I'm all in. I'm all in. And she did it with joy. She knew that that was the only way to get God's blessing and that God was always going to be with her. He cares about her, was thinking about her, was standing with her and encouraging her. And it's a step of humility to say, you know what, I want God in my life. And that's, that's, that's hard, right? No, no. Humility is one of the hardest things that all of us are challenged to do. But it's through that that we enter into a place where we receive what God has for us. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. I mean, prayer is a thing of humility, right? Prayer is saying right now, when, by bowing your head, you're saying, I can't do it all on my own. I need help. I want something greater than just what I can muster up on my own. And God answers the humble. He shows grace to the humble. So if you are posturing your heart right now, I'm asking everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes if you could do that for me. But some of you now, this is your opportunity to say yes to God. 
say, I want, I want what God has for me. I want that purpose, and I want to be able to rejoice in it. Some of you have been struggling for a long time now with do I, do I serve God all in or not? God's saying, he gave his best for you. Why not do the same for him? Why not go all in for God right now? So I'm going to ask you to just pray with me right where you're at, if you would. To say, God, today is my day. Would you do that? Just right where you're at. With humility, God, today I want to follow you. I want your purpose for my life. I don't want to live like an atheist. I want your salvation. I want the gift that comes through putting my faith in Christ, but I also want your plan. If you've never asked Christ into your life, would you do that? Just say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. I open my heart to you. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name, amen.